Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. Happy anniversary, Adam. This is our 52nd episode. We have been doing this for one year. Happy anniversary, Andy. You know, it's really a, a nice bar to clear in terms of a lot of people start podcasts. I bet a lot of people did during the pandemic. Hey, we were one of them with big intentions and big dreams. And it is a lot of work to put out a show week after week for a whole year with holidays and vacations and time away and everything else. And, uh, certainly I, I kind of came to you and said, Hey, we should do a podcast sometime. And it's been so fun doing the show with you and, and thank you for all of your, your work and effort you've put into the show. For those of you who don't know, Andy does all the audio editing when you listen to the show through your podcast app every single week. And he does a phenomenal job of editing not just kind of the major cuts, but he actually goes through and, and does almost phrase by phrase, word by word editing to really make the show as tight as possible. And if you've ever watched the video version of the show, we don't come off nearly as fluent as we do in the audio because video is just a different medium. So I edit the video that you see on YouTube and sometimes on Facebook or LinkedIn and Andy edits the audio and it's been a, uh, it's been a labor of love. And I will say personally, I've learned so much doing the show, researching different topics, listening to our talented guests come on and educating us on topics. I mean, we've had guests starting with our very first one, Tanya Jenka, who literally wrote the book on application security and folks like Shannon Fritz, who are just absolute subject matter experts in things like uh, Windows and device management and Azure AD join and uh, Rachel O'Shea, who is an expert in compliance and e-discovery. We, we've had some amazing folks come on the show and uh, they've really made us and made me better for it. So it's it's been a great first year. And uh, the, the great thing, too, is we're, we have no shortage of subjects to talk about. I could think of 10, 15 subjects for shows right now because information security, it's always changing. There's always something to talk about. Thanks, Adam. And you've been a great co-host as well. Can't do the show without you. I thought for this anniversary episode, we'd kind of take a look back at some of our episodes that we have some good takeaways and kind of review those things. And also mention the episodes if people want to go back and listen to them. Our second episode ever was titled enable MFA. And surprisingly, I just came back from a security conference called InfraGuard, and there were folks there that still had not enabled it in their environment. So this was kind of a plea about a year ago to just enable it and preferably do it through conditional access if you can, but it is built into O365 as well, and you can just turn it on that way. There's a statistic that I know you like to mention, Adam, when it comes to MFA. MFA reduces the risk of account compromise by 99%. And that's based on internal Microsoft telemetry and data that we capture through our own threat intelligence and operating our own systems. And it's something folks in the Microsoft security space will, will frequently speak to. It's such a powerful, strong control it is the largest improvement in security posture of almost any control you can implement. I'm sure there's others. I mean, you could disconnect it from the network, but reasonable control, it's incredibly powerful. One of the interesting questions that I got at this security conference was MFA for on-prem resources. And I thought this was interesting because I have never thought about implementing MFA for on-prem you know, obviously for Azure AD, but for on-prem resources, as a former identity SME, Adam, how would you implement MFA for access to a server or, say, an on-prem file share? And this really came about as the customer was wrestling with Traveler's Insurance 
And in order to insure them for cybersecurity, Travelers was requesting MFA for all administrative actions. Sure. So this is something that is already documented because if you look at a concept of a passwordless journey, because this is really where we see this is coming in, eventually at a certain point, you're going to want to disallow passwords from being used at all. So in other words, disallowing single factor authentication because passwordless methodologies are inherently multi-factor because they combine something you have with either something you know or something you are. And so there's a little tick box, literally just a checkbox in Windows that says enforce smart card or Windows hello sign in for a user account. And this is something you can implement through GPO as well. But essentially, if you had an admin account and you said this admin account can only sign in through using Windows Hello or Smart Card, and only these admins are allowed to sign into this server, if you combine all of those tools in place, you've just enforced MFA to sign into that server. Done. So this is something you don't have to be done with your Windows Hello rollout to do organizationally wide because you only need to implement this on your hopefully smaller number of administrators. And this is a, this is a reasonable thing to do. So this is already built into Windows. You don't need to reinvent the wheel or go buy third-party software. And by the way, I always hate doing anything that kind of replaces or hacks into the Windows login process. I think you're asking for trouble because you're adding attack surface to obviously something that's the most attack part of Windows already. Instead, stick with the tried and true login processes that are built in, that are hardened as part of the OS, and enable that requirement for smart card or Windows low authentication. I think that's the right way to proceed. You, you could get into a much bigger conversation around blowing this up to a, a more of a zero trust conversation where you've segmented off your networks that contain the servers you might need to sign into, and there is some pathway to get into that network that privileged network that requires two factor to get there, whether that's some sort of jump box situation, Azure Bastion host, um, some sort of remote desktop client that's requesting multi-factor authentication. There's a lot of ways to do this, but that's the way I would think about it is either draw a perimeter around all servers that need to have this and then have some sort of gating mechanism that requires 2FA or really, again, kind of the simpler one is that tick box for Windows slower smart card. Another episode that we did early on was with our guest Morgan Patswald for on-prem security through Active Directory. And to me, I think the biggest takeaway here was identity, of course. You want to segment your privileged accounts. When I talked to Morgan at Ignite, I took this away and implemented it at my former employer, Exact Sciences. We separated out domain admin credentials, and ideally, you would only use those domain admin credentials to access a domain controller. That's it. Then you would have a server admin account if you are a server admin, and you would use that server admin account, which is separate from your domain admin credentials, to access and administer your servers. You have your normal user account, as always, and then if you need to, because the safest way to do things is to have your users be non-admins on their machine, but in the case of, say, IT, maybe you do need local admin, and so you'll have a local admin user that will have local admin rights on that machine. So all in all, if you are a domain admin and a server admin and you need local admin, you're going to have four accounts in total. This could be done with three accounts. You could use your server admin as the local admin as well. So I think three is the minimum if you need a domain admin as well. So that was my biggest takeaway. And then as we progressed throughout the year, we had the solar winds breach. And out of that, there was some more guidance on how to secure your on-premise privileged accounts where you don't want to sync any administrative accounts, especially domain admin, to Azure. You want to keep those separate and have a cloud account and an on-prem account for administration. Therefore, if one gets compromised, it doesn't link to the other one. Those are my two biggest takeaways there.
we also had several episodes on just identity in general. Episode 13 dealt with passwordless authentication. And again, coming out of the security conference, I was surprised at how many people didn't know about passwordless authentication. I mentioned, hey, we could just do this passwordless authentication. And it was like, what do you mean passwordless? I don't know what you mean. (laughs) So I thought I'd just take a moment to mention how to enable it. If you're using the Windows Authenticator for MFA, this becomes a possibility to do passwordless authentication. You go into the Azure portal, you browse to the authentication methods under security and policy, and you target the method of authentication to be any or passwordless. It's already defaulted to that, any mode, but you could specifically just say passwordless if you wanted to. Then there's an extra step. The user has to register their device with management, with Intune, in order to use the passwordless authentication. And what the user experience would be like is if I sign into portal.office.com, I put in my email address, let's say, uh, you know, first name, last name at company.com, and it talks to Azure. And the next screen I see will not be a password screen. It'll show a number that I have to look at the screen for the number, then go to my authenticator app, select that number, and then I'm good to go. It does the authentication on the back end, and I never have to enter in a password. So just wanted to mention that because if you're already using Microsoft Authenticator for MFA, and again, that was our first, you know, second episode, Enable MFA, If you're doing that, the passwordless experience is really, really good for users when it comes to that Authenticator app. Other passwordless methodologies, of course, include Windows Hello for Business, which I already briefly mentioned to a previous question, but we did a whole show on it, episode 49. We touched on it in our passwordless episode as well, but that is a enterprise-ready passwordless methodology that if you have a TPM on your device, you have everything you need. It's pretty much it. There's some implementation that you need to do and, and a couple of prerequisites there to check out. And again, we did a whole show on it, but something to look at or consider because even with just a pin, which does not need to meet all your password complexity requirements, you now have a two factor password list methodology um, that doesn't transmit any sort of like shared secret password over the network. It's, it's really great stuff. And then if you do have biometric capabilities on your devices, like a Surface device with a, a IR camera to do facial recognition and depth mapping, it's an even better experience. Just look at your computer and you're signed in. It's amazing. Or you can even get like a Logitech Brio camera and it'll do it externally if you don't have it baked in. Anyhow, um, you know, you've got options for passwordless for sure. The Authenticator app's the easy button to do it. Uh, Windows Slow for Business. Also Fido 2. Of course, is is kind of a cool technology with your FIDO2 keys from YubiKey or, or other third parties. And that's something you plug into the USB port, you do a thing, and then you're signed in as well. So passwordless is definitely, as, as I always say when we discuss this, it's not something where you need to say, oh, well, I just saw a password prompt. Clearly, passwordless is worthless. Quite the opposite. We cannot get rid of passwords in all of the places until we've worked out all the rough edges with password less, until we've validated all the use cases, until we've solved all the scenarios. The way you get rid of passwords is you have a credible alternative that's ready to go. And so the way you get your organization ready is you start kicking the tires on this stuff and maybe move beyond kicking the tires. Find that group where some sort of passwordless makes a ton of sense for them. Whether that's some sort of customer facing group where Buying them premium hardware like Surface makes a ton of sense. Pilot Windows all over business with them. Why not? They have the best experience already. Um, or you have somebody who's mobile all day long and they're on their iPhone and Android all day long. Make sure they have passwordless in their authenticator app. So if they do get prompted to sign in, they're not trying to type their hopefully complex password on their mobile device keyboard. Give them that great passwordless experience. There's a lot of options for this to get started, but the most important thing is exactly that get started. And that's the only way we get rid of passwords. 
One of our other episodes on Passwordless was also on single sign-on. And I'll just mention this briefly. If you are a Microsoft customer and you use Azure AD, that is an identity provider. And you can use Azure AD as a single sign-on solution, SAML to SaaS apps. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Adam, that it's available for the free tier now as well. Single sign-on is not a paid for service. So there you go. Mm -hmm. So you have a method to onboard your SaaS apps for free using Azure AD. Mm -hmm. So definitely do that because that's a great way to control your applications as well as if you roll into Azure AD joining your devices, you get that single sign-on experience for your users right on the device itself. And speaking of Azure AD joining devices, one of our episodes, episode 25 with Shannon Fritz is our most popular episode and it talks all about device identity. And what we want to say here is, you know, when it comes to Azure AD joining devices, there are a lot of fallacies. You don't, you want to do it because of conditional access, because you want to make sure that if the user is accessing a company application or data, that that device is compliant. And you can only do that through two ways, hybrid Azure AD joining or Azure AD joining the device. So when it comes to security, you got to get to one of those ways. But we'll argue that Azure AD joining a device is cleaner because it's pure cloud, whereas hybrid Azure AD join still has that tether to on-prem AD. It is essentially a domain joined machine with a separate registration to Azure, but it is still a domain joined machine. So if you want the future, Azure AD join your device. And, you know, we answered a lot of fallacies in that episode and talking about, you know, I can't access my on-prem resources if I have an Azure AD join device. Wrong. You can as long as you can resolve DNS, you have network connection, and you have an identity, which you do, and it's probably synced to Azure so that you have that same identity and password, then you can access your on-prem resources. So just get started with that. We talk about how you just take a device, reset it to Ubi, and join it and see what you can and cannot do, right? You start there, see if you need to download the apps, Okay, you need Office, download that and install it. You need Wi-Fi. Okay, we'll join to the Wi-Fi. And then once you see that you can actually do your work on an Azure AD join device, then you start looking at management. And you start to push out those apps. You start to push out the Wi-Fi profile. And then you roll into autopilot and automated device enrollment. But listen to that episode. It's one of our best episodes out there. A lot of good information in there. Get started with Azure AD join. I think it's become more topical than ever. So I will say in my day job at Microsoft as a security compliance and identity specialist, I am having more customers than ever come to me and say, what's this Azure AD join thing? What are the gotchas? What do I need to know? How do I get started? What licenses do I need? Which by the way, you actually can do it with free Azure AD. You don't, you don't need a license. Um, So it's topical right now, even though this is episode 25, so it's almost half a year ago, which is crazy. feels like we just recorded that yesterday with Shannon. Uh, There's a ton here, and it's top of mind because I think, Andy, ultimately the point I always hammer is if you're looking at architecture, any architecture that assumes persistent line of sight to an internal network resource should not be part of your architecture in 2021, period. And this is a way you start to move away from that architecture. Again, I am not saying your organization should fund a lift and shift to shift all of your devices to Azure AD join tomorrow. No, because the ROI on that is probably hard to articulate. However, what I am saying is I would love to have you test this, validate it, work around the rough edges, 
figure out how to make it work and make that your new standard for devices moving forward, because there isn't a good way to migrate existing devices in the field. In fact, it's practically impossible. It really is a wipe and reinstall. So you, the way you get to Azure AD join is not, here's what we're going to do to all our existing deployed devices. It's the opposite. Here is where we are going to start moving forward, deploy all net new devices with AAD join. So listen to this. The time is now. It's never been more topical. And it was, again, we, we had a great guest on there who could really speak to a lot of the concerns and fallacies because sure. Does it support GPO? No, it doesn't. Does it support single sign-on to on-premises resources? Why, yes, it does, actually. Can I print to on-premises resources? Why, yes, you can, actually. Um, so can't plug that show enough. And certainly tons of you have listened to it and tons of you who don't even subscribe to the show have listened to it. But uh, if there's anything, I mean, you know, I, I think we're, we're given the highlights here of things that we are revisiting because we feel so passionately and strongly about. This is one of them to me where it's just like, do not persist another day in an architecture that doesn't make sense for the world around us. And I get, it's not an overnight thing, but the way it becomes a someday thing, as opposed to a never thing requires you or the people in charge of making these decisions and investigating it technically to start doing that. So get going, get started. We did a lot of episodes as well on just the career field of cybersecurity. One of my favorite ones that we did was how to get into cybersecurity. That was episode 28, where we talked about all the actual skills, the knowledge. We broke it down very granular on the specific things that we think are the basis that you would start with in a career for cybersecurity. And we also did a fun episode early on episode seven on how Adam and I got into cybersecurity because it's not always a straight line. It may be these days a little bit more because there's degree granting programs in cybersecurity and, and maybe you can graduate and get a job right there. You've interned for a company and you can get a job in cybersecurity. But you know, for us who are a little bit older and may have gotten into the game a little bit later, we have different life experiences that are important you know, Adam always talks about diversity in the cybersecurity field. That's not only in maybe ethnicity, but it's also in your background. Like I want English majors in cybersecurity. Guess what? Technical writing is important. We need those people. I want sales folks in cybersecurity because it's good to sell internally. Those communication skills are important in cybersecurity. So those are all Good episodes to listen to. We also did one on mentorship, which I think is super important in any career field, but specifically in cybersecurity because there is a talent shortage. And how do we get people to become more knowledgeable in the career field? It's mentorship. And we talked to an old mentor of mine, one of my first mentors in the field, Matt Wood. And so that's a really great episode to listen to. And our Christmas episode was on a home lab. And this is also great for folks who are getting into the field. I think we released that episode hoping that people would listen to it and then maybe use their vacation over Christmas to build a home lab. But one of the takeaways for that one, and I'll kind of drive it through now, is that you can get a free M365 E5 developer tenant with pretty much all the licensing for all the security stuff. And this is important even if you aren't building it for a home lab, maybe you want a dev environment for your company. If you want something to deploy and test out different policies, you get EMS E5, you get cloud app security, you get full Intune, you get Office for defend, uh, op, Defender for Office, Defender for Endpoint. You get all that stuff. Actually, I don't think you get Defender for Endpoint because it doesn't come with Windows licensing. But definitely Defender for Office and all the EMS stuff. The only thing that's missing is really Windows licensing from there. But importantly, you can still test a lot of that cloud stuff in a dev environment. 
you're not sure how a CA rule is going to react, deploy it in the dev tenant. See how it's going to act. So that is a key point to take away from the home lab. And there's certainly a ton of information in that one as well. Definitely have a listen to that one if you are looking to build a lab for yourself. On all of these subjects, and and they're all interrelated, kind of how should you get into cybersecurity? How did we get into cybersecurity? What's mentorship look like? What's a way you can invest in your own learning? The, we've done a lot on that already, and, and I think we'll continue to touch on these because cybersecurity has that talent shortage. Uh, we talked last week in our episode about um, Apple and, and their CSAM detection, how in, in one of the, the technologies they're talking about deploying, I, I mentioned that someone that I like to listen to, Brianna Wu from the Rocket Podcast, had, had brought up a conversation around um, potential impacts of, of young um, adolescents with uh, potential um, LGBTQ leanings. And it was one of those where I suggested maybe the, the team that had built that um, could have included some more diversity um, to maybe have better predicted those kind of outcomes or those kinds of concerns. And so there's examples all over the place in every aspect of cybersecurity or product engineering or everything else where uh, the, the more diverse thinkers we can bring to the table, the better off our products will be because, you know, any more products are used globally. They're used around the world by people from all religions, from all backgrounds, from all cultures and climates and, and everything in between. And if our teams don't reflect that, then they're not going to make products or, or protect um, our organizations in, in a way that aligns with the attackers of the world, because the attackers are certainly going to have diverse backgrounds as well. And they're going to think about things differently. So um, we want to broaden the net of who comes into this business, whether that's sales, which Andy and I kind of both do different flavors of, or, or security engineering, which Andy has done in the past or end user computing that I've done in the past. Uh, any way we can help bring more people in and help you learn more and be better at your job. That's, that's the whole point of this show. The show is the blue security podcast for blue hat wearers for defenders. That's, that's who we're here for. And so, um, it, it's been fun talking about that and it's going to continue to come up because obviously it's so foundational to the show overall. The show is about learning and about growth. And sometimes that's about technology and sometimes that's about, you know, navigating the, the business world. So more to come on that for sure. But, um, I especially loved the episode on the home lab as well, because we identified so many things that are inexpensive or just straight up free that you can use to test out a lot of these technologies and get hands-on and get familiar with them. And there's no replacement for it in a lot of this. You can read technical documentation, you can get certifications, you can do all those things. But I learned more from having a, a demo tenant and or a test tenant and making conditional access rules and seeing what happened. Because I I like learned things I didn't know that are it's not that they're not documented. It's that documentation can't account for every scenario because you can go build some really wacky stuff and see what happens. That's the best way to learn is sometimes with the product under duress and see how it responds to that. So love, love all of, all of that conversation. And again, I think you'll continue to see that as the focus of the show, because again, it's so foundational to what we set out to do in the first place. We also had a few episodes on, communication skills or just communication in general. And for me, this was one of the things that I learned later on in my security career. But I think it's important that if you can develop these skills early on, they're going to serve you well in your career. We talked with my old boss, Doug Turchek, on security leadership, how to get funding for security programs, how to interact with the C-suite, how to lead a team because security is a hard job. And so that morale of the team, how do you keep that up? And, and you know, that's all leadership skills, but also communication in general. We had an episode on change management, episode 34, and that's how to communicate a change that you're trying to deploy 
and how to make that successful. Because if you're not following the steps and you're just shotgunning a change out, people are probably going to get upset. The episode that I talked with my former coworker, Nate Gardner, about some mistakes that security teams make. And I made some of these mistakes in that, you know, if you don't have that relationship, that trust built with the business and the end users, and you're trying to make a change, they're not going to respond well to it. When I got into information security, I started at the help desk. And so I had relationships built at that company already. But when I went to exact sciences, I was brand new. I came in as security. So I hadn't established those relationships. And so people didn't understand that I was doing things in good faith. They just knew that Andy was breaking things in the environment and they didn't like that. So that was something that I learned and I learned the hard way, but hopefully you can listen to some of these episodes and learn from my mistakes and hopefully not make them in yours and learn how to communicate well, learn how to write well, learn how to develop those relationships because you're going to use that social capital, that friendship someday to say, Hey, remember, you know, the, the thing that I did for you? Well, you know, I have a new product that I need you to test. I need you to be on this testing team for this. I'm going to deploy a new policy and I need you to help me out and, and see what it does to your device. And so you're going to use those relationships and leverage them in a give and take when it comes to security policies and products that you're going to deploy. So the important thing is, is that I think more than 50% of InfoSec is not products and cool tools that we're going to play with and policies. It's communication and developing those relationships. Spoken from my own heart as well. I am a huge believer that one of the things that has enabled me to be successful in my own career has been communication skills and particularly writing because so much of the modern corporate world is written. And if you can communicate your thoughts clearly through writing, it gives you a leg up on those who cannot. Everyone, everyone says this meeting could have been an email, which means you need to write it out then. And if you're only good verbally, well, then you're the kind of person who's ticking everybody else off because you insist on a meeting instead of an email. Uh, and I'm being kind of flippant here, but in, in all seriousness, it's such a just wickedly important skill as, as all of these are, as leadership skills are, or understanding how leaders think. I thought that was the most interesting takeaway from episode 36 with Doug on security leadership. He really gave you a chance to understand like, what is he thinking about? Who is he responding to? Who is he working with? What do his bosses want to see from him? Because if you just learn nothing in life, but understand what your manager is being graded on and help make them look good, it will pay dividends for you throughout your whole career. No matter what your career is, make your manager look good. Never blindside them. That's like the most basic, like being successful in the business world 101 is do those things or in any world, really uh, change management. That's an interesting one because there's, there's two things here. Number one, I think security teams um, go one of two directions. Either you far over prepare for a change and scare people about it when maybe it's not that big of a deal or you under communicate it and don't understand the level of impact there is. Or you are an organization that either the security team is acting as a drag on innovation or the rest of IT is acting as a drag on your ability to improve security posture. But there's always somebody in IT who's like holding everybody back. They're the parachute at the end of the dragster, right? And one of the unique perspectives that you get in, in the work that Andy and I both do at Microsoft now is that when you work with, I have 26 different customers, Andy, I bet you have close to a hundred. You get to see all types of organizations and security shops, and you learn like who's successful and who's not. And, you know, some customers get a reputation that they don't get anything done. 
some customers get the reputation that they are rock stars at getting things deployed. And so, of course, this, this is cultural, it's leadership driven, it's people driven. There's a lot of factors here, but that can change. Organizations that had traditionally been really difficult to get things done at, they'll get a couple of new leaders in who say, we're going to be innovative, we're going to invest, we're going to do this. And all of a sudden they're a rocket ship and they want to do all the things. So it can change very, very quickly when you get the right people in place. But the reason I say that is for the most part, unless you really think you are the leader of the pack, you probably could go faster. If your goal is to secure your organization and if your goal is to keep the bad guys out, obviously that includes implementing as many strong controls as possible while also managing the rate of change for your users. And if you think you are going as fast as you possibly can, like, and there's no organization faster than you, then maybe you are. But for the majority of organizations, believe us, we know this, you can go faster because other people can and do. And you can do it safely and responsibly and with a user-centric focus in mind. Um, and all that's to say, you know, if our goal is to just, you know, make our customer, not make our customers, make our environment secure and safe and protected, then we need to do as much as we can. And the way we do that is by understanding how our leaders think, understanding how to implement change in a responsible, safe, but fast manner, and understanding mistakes to avoid and understanding how to communicate. And so we've had shows on all of those topics as well, between leadership, change management, mistakes security teams make. So, you know, review those if, if those are things you're running into or, you know, you want to learn more about. Um, but we can always do better um, in, our, in our own world to, to accomplish our goals. And so I think that's kind of the takeaway there is we're all learning, right? I don't think there is a destination. I don't think anybody's gotten to the point when they say, yeah, we've got this thing figured out. You know, we know what we're doing. We we're going to put it on cruise control from here. Like if you have that mindset, you're doing it wrong. I think I'd feel pretty confident saying, um, but thankfully more than ever, I think I see more growth mindset than ever in security organizations where once I'll be honest and, and in my own it career, I saw security as a blocker. Um, I I've seen a, a culture change where I think security professionals today recognize how much they don't know and are committed to, you know, lifelong learning to constantly get better and recognize that, you know, attack methodologies are going to change. Technologies are going to change. And it's the nature of the business you're in that the rate of change is really, really fast. And you have to try as hard as you can to keep up. Yeah. Something I learned, and this is something that you can take away from this show. I don't know if I've ever mentioned it, but security is a business enabler. And that's something that took me a while to learn. I thought that I was there to make the company safe, but in reality, I'm there to make the company be productive mm -hmm. and make money, but also protect them. But we are a business enabler. Right. So well said. It has been a great ride for this last year, Adam. We have a lot more to come. As you said, we have topics lined up. There's always stuff happening, so <laughs> there is no shortage of episodes that are going to be coming your way. We hope to continue to do this for a while longer. And so thanks for listening. Thank you to all of our listeners out there who have stuck with us. And, you know, share the podcast if you enjoy it. Share them with your other coworkers and your other security-minded folks who want to learn about it. That's our show for this week. We hope to hear you guys next week, or we hope to see you guys next week. <laughs> and if you guys have any questions, our contact information will be in the show notes. We'll talk to you guys later. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.